Hello everyone, in this video, I'm going to talk to you about the step-by-step -step process of importing your vehicle from US to Canada, all right, end-to-end -end process. This is going to be a very detailed video and this video is intended to be more of a, of a guide. So you can watch this video right now, the whole thing, or if you want, you can just come back and just watch certain sections of it whenever you're importing the vehicle. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the timestamps for the different steps in the description below. Also, all the web links that I talk about, I'm going to put them in the description as well. So when you're watching the video, you can just follow along and not worry about copying the, the text from the, from the screen. All right, so let's get started. Step one. First off, we need to check if your vehicle model is even eligible to be imported to Canada. All right, there's a link over there. You can click on that link, go through the entire list and find your model. For the most part though, if a vehicle model is sold in US and it's sold in Canada, it's gonna be on that list, All right? So say for instance, if you have a, a Honda Accord or a Toyota Camry or a Ford F-150, it's gonna be on that list, all right? But again, check that list, make sure. The main caveat to this is, is if you have a gray market vehicle. What is defined as a gray market vehicle is a vehicle that was originally sold in a country besides US or Canada. So say for instance, you have a vehicle right now in US and this vehicle was originally sold say in Australia or Germany or something and you imported that car from there to US. So what, and now you, so there were modifications which were made to the car for it to be registered in US and now you're trying to again import that same vehicle to Canada and if that vehicle is less than 15 years old, then you cannot import it, All right? So gray market vehicles less than 15 years old, they're not eligible. So check for that, accept that, check that list. Your car should be on it for the most part. And then we can move on to step number two. Now, if your vehicle is eligible, the next thing we got to check for is your vehicle's title history. So what's the title history? It's kind of like a driver record, but for your car. What I mean by that is, you know, when you get a speeding ticket or if you get into an accident, it stays on your driving record. Similarly, there is a history record like that for your car and that's under your car's title history. Now, what's the quickest way to check for it is to go check your car's physical vehicle title. I'm gonna show you a couple of them right now. So you see this green one over here, that's the clean Michigan title. It doesn't say anything. And you see that vehicle brand, it says none, which means it's a clean history. No record is good record. If there's anything on, if there's anything on it, it's gonna show up over there. Often what the states also do is to just make it very obvious. They print a car that has a branded title in a different color. So in Michigan, I think they print it in orange color, so it's just very visible. So say if you were just buying a car within the US uh, and the seller's trying to sell you the car, the moment you see the title, it just says, or it's probably gonna be an orange title in Michigan, for instance, and uh, you'll just know. And on the title, it's gonna say, branded title, salvage, rebuilt. Now what the salvage and rebuilt means is when your car has been in a major accident and the insurance company that insured it says that, okay, it's too expensive to fix this car, might as well just pay off the money and just be done with it. At that point, the car is considered to be salvage. Now the exact terminology, it depends from state to state. So it could either be salvage, total loss, write off. Those are just the different terms used, but they differ from state to state. Now what happens is a car gets into a big accident, becomes a salvage car. Someone can buy that car. Now they can fix it, get it recertified and register again to be driven on the roads. At that point, it's registered as a rebuilt car. All right, and that's a permanent thing. It stays on the record. So the reason why I even talk about all these things is because if you have a clean title vehicle, it's the easiest thing. You can bring the car across to Canada, no problems. But if you have a salvage vehicle or a rebuild title vehicle, then it gets a little bit more complicated because you can import it to Canada, but whether or not you'll be able to register it in your province or your territory, it depends. And the work that has to go into it, the additional work that has to go into it, it depends. And you need to call around and find out about what the exact process is for your province or territory. All right, simple case is you have a clean title vehicle. So, First off, let's see again that Michigan title. See, that's clean. Nothing on that history. Now let's look at a vehicle that has a salvage title. See, that's a state of Nevada. And it says right there, total loss on the brand and it's a salvage title. So there you have it. So the vehicle title is one place to look for it. If you wanna be really sure, what you could also do 
is purchase a Carfax report. I'm going to put the link for that over here as well. It costs 40 US dollars. You can buy the report for your vehicle. You just put in your vehicle details and your vehicle VIN number. VIN number is the vehicle identification number, which is a 17 digit unique number just for your car. You put that number in there, it's going to give you a report and it's going to show you the entire history. Who bought it? When did they buy it? When was it registered? Which different states it was registered? If it was ever in any accidents, structure damage, clean title, was it rebuilt title, all those things, it's all going to be there. All right. I'm going to show you a couple of screenshots of that right now. Let's look at it. So you see the Sonata over here. It's a 2011 Sonata. Clean title. No issues. No accidents. No structure damage. No airbag deployment. No issues. So this is what is called a clean title vehicle. Easy case. All right. So if you have a car like that, perfect. That's good. And now we can move on to step three. Before we move on to step three, the one thing, in addition to the salvage rebuild, as I mentioned, you can bring it, but it's a little bit more work. Clean title is the best. The one thing, though, you got to watch out for is if your car has flood damage or water damage on it. If it has that, then you just cannot import the car to Canada. Like That's a strict no-no. You can import it to Canada, but you cannot register it in Canada. You can import it so that the car can be parted out and sold for parts, but you cannot register it to be driven in Canada. So if it's water damage, flood damage, you can stop the video right now and just sell that car in US and figure out what to do when you get to Canada. And that's pretty much it when it comes to title search. Let's move on to step number three. Now step three is the vehicle modifications. The reason why I mentioned it over here is because it may cost you a few hundred dollars to get these modifications on your car when you bring it to Canada. And uh, you need to figure out if it's uh, even worth it for you to do it. For instance, if you're bringing across a car that only costs you $1,000, it doesn't really make sense to spend $500 on it just to modify it to be imported to Canada, when you could just buy a $1,000 car in Canada as well, which already has all the right modifications in it. Now, what are those modifications? There's a list over here at this link. It's going to show you the entire list, all the different modifications your car needs. The two main ones is speedometer and daytime running lights. Let's look at it. Speedometer is that when a car in US, the speedometer is a, a car in US has a speed in miles per hour. For it to be imported to Canada, it also needs to have speed in kilometers per hour. So let's look at the screenshot over here. You see this car? On the outside, it's got the speed in miles per hour. On the inside, it's got the speed in kilometers per hour. So that's good. That's all right. So you want a car that has something like that. If you do not, then you can always just change the instrument cluster and put a new one in. It costs around $200, $300, depending on the car. But uh, so yeah, it's going to cost you a few hundred dollars for that. The second thing to check for is daytime running lights or DRL. There's two main types of DRLs. One is like this one that I'm showing you here on the Elantra. It's a white LED strip. Or the second one is just a regular yellow light that's always on when the car is on. So if your car has that, it's perfect. You don't need any modifications. You can obviously check the entire list. But for the most part, cars which are made in US and made in Canada, they're built to the same standards because it's just cheaper for the manufacturers as well. Uh, so, but again, check that entire list. And these are the two main things to watch out for. All right, that's it. Now let's move on to step number four. So step four is recall check. Before you can import the car into Canada and register it, you need to get the recalls taken care of. All right, the way to go about it is you can, first you have to find out if your car even has any open recalls on it or not. So the way to go about it is you're going to go on Google, type in Honda VIN recall check if you have a Honda or Toyota or Hyundai or whatever your manufacturer is. Go on their website, you put in your VIN number for your car, again that same 17 digit number, you put that number in there and it's going to show you if there's any open recalls for your car. If there are, you need to contact the dealer Schedule an appointment for, to get the recalls taken care of. If you cannot find that website for your manufacturer, you can just call the dealer directly and just give them, again, give them the VIN number. They'll look it up for you and tell you if there's any open recalls for your car. If there are, take care of it. If not, you need proof. So there's two ways to get that proof. You can either take that screenshot of the manufacturer's website that states that your VIN number has an open recall. Take that screenshot, print it off, and keep it for your record. Or the dealer can print one out for you as well, just which says, okay, this car, this VIN number has no open recalls. So those are the two ways you can get proof that shows that this car has no more open recalls. Again, 
if you had to get recalls taken care of, when the dealer is taking care of the recalls on your car, they can also print out a sheet like that that states that the, all the recalls on this car are now taken care of. So get that taken care of, but do that only in the US. Don't, don't be lazy about it. Don't be like, yeah, I'll take care of it when I go to Canada because it's just going to be harder. Because if you come to a Canadian dealer over here, say if you have a Honda Accord, again, uh, you come to Canada and you go to a Honda dealership over here, what the Honda dealer is going to say, be like, sir, sorry, this car is a US car. You got to take it back to US and get it taken care of over there. And that's just more hassle for you, right? So don't be lazy. Just take care of it right now. And I mean, you got to take care of open recalls anyhow. So do that. Now that you've taken care of the recalls, the next thing is bank loans or liens, all right? If you have a vehicle right now in US that still has ongoing finance payment on it, you got to pay it off. Because if there's an extending loan on that car and you're trying to bring the car to, you, to Canada, you can't do it, right? You can't have the case where you still have a payment going on for that car in US and you've imported that car to Canada. It just doesn't work that way. So again, if it's a very expensive car, you have a lot of payments left on it, you got to consider it. Maybe it's just better to just sell the car in US and then come to Canada and do it because maybe you don't want to put in all that cash just to pay off the car right away right now, right? It's just something to consider. Now, how do you find out if, you, if there's any lien on it? Again, there's two ways. One, maybe you don't even have the title with you, the physical title that I've been talking about, the ones that you showed you earlier. Maybe you don't have it. You don't have it because the bank that has the loan on your car, they've kept it with them. And only after you made the last payment or only after you've paid the loan off in full, they only then will they ship you the physical title in mail. Or if you do have the title, on the title itself is going to say that there is a lien on it. Let's look at that Michigan title again. See, on this one, it says no secured interest on record, which means there is no lien on this particular vehicle title. All right? So that's one way to check for. And see, if you do have a lien, what you could do is just pay off the bank and you decide to pay it off. So pay off the loan and get a letter from the bank. Okay, I'm going to show you what one of those letters look like right there. See, the letter states this loan was paid off for this loan number. So again, just get a letter like that from your bank, which states that you've paid off the lien on this car and keep that letter with you. Take a digital photo of it and make a digital copy of it. Okay, keep that for your records. And that's pretty much it. Now, let's move on to the next step. So step number six, documentation and details. We need to make sure that we have all this stuff with us before we even move on to the next step. So first off, a physical vehicle title. Make sure you have this. Second, a bill of sale. Now, if you bought this car that you have, you bought it from a dealer, then the dealer should have given you an invoice stating how much you purchased the car for. If you don't have it, Contact the dealer. They will very likely have that with them in their records in the archive somewhere, and they'll pull out a copy for your reference. So get that bill of sale. Or if you bought this car from a private party, from a private individual, you should have gotten a bill of sale. All right, I'm going to show you what a simple bill of sale looks like. See this one over here. It clearly just states, okay, who the seller is, who the buyer is, which, the, which car it is, the VIN number of the car, the price, and the date. That's it. It doesn't have to be anything fancy and the signatures of both the buyer and the seller. That's it. You have that, that is a good enough bill of sale. Next thing what you need is the current value of the car, not the value what you paid for, what the current value of the car is. So you can get that from Kelly Blue Book. Here's the link for it and just go on there and I'm going to show you what it looks like. Just put in basic details. The vehicle year, model year, make, model, trim, mileage, where you're living right now, or, or the details about the color, navigation system, sunroof, so on and so forth. Just fill in the details, click submit, and it's going to give you the value of the car today. So in this case, the number is 13166, all right? So that's the current value of this particular car. So get that number, take a screenshot of it, and keep it for your reference. The next thing what you need is your passport. And what you need is you need to know the exact date when you're going to cross the border and which border you're going to cross at. Okay, they are very particular about this. You can't just decide, be like, yeah, I'll cross, say, on the 14th of January or something. And then you show up on the 15th and be like, oh, no, I was late. I wanted to say goodbye to my friends because I was moving. Doesn't work. All right, you can't be like, oh, I wanted to cross over here, but then I decided to take a detour and cross at the other border. Doesn't work. You need to know which day and which border. 
all right? So click on this link over here, figure out which location we're gonna cross at, and call that border, and find out what their working hours are. Because if you, because only some of the borders are open 24 seven, and if you think that you're gonna show up at 11 p.m. at this border, maybe if they're not open to process your vehicle export and import, then it doesn't work. So figure that out, and then figure out the date and which border. Have that detail handy with you. And now we are ready to move on to the next step. So before you can import the car to Canada, you need to export it out of the US, all right? So you need to let the US Customs know that this car is now exported, and they need to process that export in their system. It used to be the case that you could just show up at the, at the US border and just tell them, like, I'm exporting this car, but not anymore, not, not since the last few years. The way to do it is you need to do an AES filing. AES stands for Automated Export System. And the thing is, you cannot just do it yourself. You need to do it through a customs broker. Now, I've done this a few times, and every time I've used AD Rutherford, you can go with any customs broker you want. Uh, you can find out about them. Just do a quick Google search, AES filing for vehicle export, and a bunch of them show up. I'm just gonna show you the one that I went with. It cost me 50 US dollars, and it takes them about one business day to do the AES filing, all right? Now, just to think about the AES filing is, once you do the filing, what you get in return is something called the ITN number. All right, ITN number is kind of like a case number or a file number, and you need that number. And uh, that's the main thing you're looking for when you do the AES filing. And when you're gonna do this filing with whichever broker you go with, they may offer you to notify customs, all right? They may tell you, be like, oh yeah, not only will we do this AES filing, but we will also notify customs for you, and we'll charge you an additional $10, $15 for that. I've done it multiple times and I've never chosen that option. Because that now the thing with this customs notification is, the way this works is this. You do the AES filing, you get that ITN number. Now for whatever reason, from the day or from the time point you've gotten a seven, that, that ITN number, you need to wait at least 72 hours before you cross the border, all right? So it takes 72 hours for that ITN number to show up in the custom system. So if you've decided to cross the border on say the 18th at 6 p.m. in the evening, then you need to have the ITN number with you filed by at least the 15th, all right? You need to have that number ready and prepped at least 72 hours prior to you actually crossing the border. And you can do this in advance as up to six months in advance. If you know that exact border you're gonna cross and the day you're gonna cross it, you can do this ITN filing up to six months in advance. But the, but the latest you can do is at least 72 hours before you actually cross. So that's that whole 72 hours custom notification thing. Well, so what the customs broker is gonna say that we're gonna notify customs. Some people say that you can you do it yourself by sending out an email to customs at that border where you're gonna cross. Some people are like, you can call them up. In my experience, as long as you just wait that wait and give them that 72 hour gap before you actually show up, you'll be fine. You don't have to email them, you don't have to call them, you don't have to pay anyone to notify customs to do any of that stuff. So that's what that whole 72 hours gap, that notice window, that's what it's for. Now I'm gonna walk you through that entire process of filling out the forms. And again, you can just skip it, uh, skip, and again, you can just skip through this right now if, you, if you're just watching this video for information purposes, or you can go through it if you're actually filling out the forms right now, and if you decide to go with this particular customs broker. So let's go through it right now. All right, so I'm just gonna speed up this video. So if, if you're filling it out, you can slow down the video so you can follow along but I'm just gonna talk about the major things in the form as we go along. So the main thing over here, first off, you select AES filing only. If you already own the car in US, you just put in your US address and your US details over there. Then just put your Canadian address and your Canadian details. If you're an individual, you don't need to have any business name, no GST number. Just put in your Canadian address, phone number, email, Canadian passport number, Put all that stuff over there. When shipment information, your make model, the VIN number of the car, the title number should be on the US title, and the title state, uh, just the two digit code, like if it's Michigan, it's MI. The port of export is the border you're gonna cross it at, and the date of crossing. 
in MMDDYY5 format, so month post. Mode of transport is self-driven, no transport carrier, and no SEAC code. The purchase price is the car value when you bought it, so what's on the bill of sale. Sign it, date it. Now let's go to the credit card pre-authorization form over here. Put in your name, Canadian details over there. Email address, no GST number. Put in your credit card details over there. They only, they only accept Visa or MasterCard. Let's put that over there quick. Put in your billing address. Sign it and date it. So if you can do e-sign, that's good. If not, then after you fill out the forms, you're gonna have to print it off, sign it, scan it, and send it to them. Over here, put in the bridge or the tunnel, however you're gonna cross it, the name of the crossing. Put in details about the shipment itself, like where the shipment's coming from. And name of supplier is your own name. Value of goods is the current value of the car. Description is like the, the year, make, model, and the VIN number. Importer information is, again, your Canadian details. Once you fill this out, again, just sign it and date it. And that's pretty much it. Everything else is for commercial stuff. You don't have to worry about that. So now, once you submit the form, like I said, it's going to take them about one business day to do it. And they're going to give you a receipt that has the IT number in it. Now do yourself a favor and actually print this off. Don't be like, oh, yeah, it's all digital only. I'm going to keep it on my phone. It's not going to work for a couple of reasons. I mean, it may work, but very likely it won't. And you don't want to take that chance because it's just a lot of hassle. It's, and it's a very simple thing. You just go and print it. It's just one single piece of paper, right? So the reason why it's not going to work or may not work is, one, it's going to be on your phone. And when you're in the customs office, they can get very picky about no electronic equipment at all. So if it's on your phone and they don't allow for cell phones or any electronic equipment, how are you going to show them the ITN number? Second, if it's in your email and when you show up at the U.S. customs office, it's right at the border. So you may have issues with your phone trying to jump between the Canadian network and the U.S. network and roaming, and you may not get data over there. So you may not be able to pull it up on your email or your battery may run out or anything can happen, right? So do yourself a favor and just print this off so you have a physical copy of the ITN with you. Now at this point, you've got a whole lot of documents. So I really suggest that you go get one of these folders for yourself, all right? In this, you put all the vehicle documents. You put in the title, you put in this ITN number, you put in the, the bank's payoff letter, you put the bill of sale up, and that screenshot that shows there's no recall. You put all that stuff that we just talked about, you, you print it off, you put it in that folder, all right? Now we are finally ready to go and export this car out of US. So on the day of the export, this is how it works. You drive up there to the US-Canadian border. Before you get on that bridge to go to Canada, before you get on the bridge, the tunnel, whatever the border crossing is like, on the US side of it, right by around by where that duty-free store is, you'll see a sign over there that says US CBP, which is US Customs and Border Protection. There's gonna be a sign and there's gonna be a gate over there. That's the entrance to the US Customs Office. So you drive your car there, you who owns the car, you drive the car that is getting exported. Don't be like, oh yeah, my friend's gonna drive it and he's gonna show up three hours later. No, none of that stuff works. The owner of the car, the registered owner, the person in that AES filing we talked about, the one who's actually importing the car to Canada, that person has to drive that car that is being exported and being imported, exported out of, exported out of US and imported to Canada. So you, you yourself, you drive that car, go to the customs office gate there. There's gonna be a couple officers, they're gonna come up and ask you, what's your business? You tell them that you're exporting this car out of US. The last year, if you have the paperwork, that's when this folder comes handy. And uh, they'll direct you to go park your car in a very particular spot. You go park there, you get all your documents and you grab your own passport and you go in the office. And one thing to note about the passport is if you are in US on a visa, whatever the visa is, work visa, student visa, whatever the visa is, 
make sure that your personal visa stuff is all up to date and it's not expired. The next thing you know, you go in there to process your vehicle export and then your personal visa stuff is out of date and that becomes a center of focus and then just leads to more hassle, right? So along with your vehicle documents, make sure your personal documents are all up to date as well. So what happens is you go in there, you give them your passport, you give them the vehicle title, you give them the ITN number. They input all this information in their system, they'll check for it, takes about five to seven minutes, and then they may just stamp your US title with the date on it, or an officer may escort you out to actually check that the title matches the vehicle that's parked there, compare the VIN number, compare it all, and then they will stamp the US title. So all you get is just a stamped US title with the CBP officer's stamp on it, and you take that, you get in your car, and now you drive over to Canada. All the US vehicle stuff is done, all right? You've done the recall, you've, you've done the ITN filing, you've actually processed the export, you've paid off the bank, you've done, you made sure your car is eligible, you made sure your vehicle history is good, you've done all that stuff, now you're finally driving over to Canada. Half the work is done, all right? I know it's a lengthy process to stay with me. Most of the paperwork is done at this point, actually. Uh, now it's just about shelling out the money. <laughs> But, uh, okay, so you show up there at the, at the Canadian border and you tell the officer there that you are importing the vehicle. So they will direct you to secondary. You go there, you park where the officer tells you to park. And before you go inside the office, this is what you need. You need the vehicle manufacturer date. You need the vehicle's current mileage. You need the, the vehicle's title. And you need the vehicle's VIN number. And you need the title, the stamp title that you had just gotten five minutes prior on the US side. You need that stamped US title. And now where do you find the manufacturer date? So right when you open up the driver's side door, you see how it is in this image? So right when you open the driver's side uh, door, there's going to be a sticker over there. It's going to have the manufacturer date on it. And you, you can get the vehicle mileage as well. And you can go in there. Give all the information to the Canadian border officer. They'll process it. And now, you need to pay the import tax. So this is where there's a small caveat to it. If you are a permanent resident who's first time moving to Canada, then up to $10,000, you can bring a vehicle up, to, you can bring a vehicle up to $10,000 without paying any import taxes on it. Or if you're a returning Canadian resident, like say if you were working in US for a few years and now you're moving back to Canada permanently, um, then up to, again, up to $10,000, you're exempt. So you don't pay any import taxes on it. But say if you have a fancier car and the car is worth, say, $20,000, say, say it's worth, say, $25,000, to keep it simple. Then you only pay import tax on the, the, the amount of money over 10000 So you only pay on the last $15,000, assuming your car is worth $25,000. So you pay the 5% GST tax on it. You pay the $100 AC tax if your car has AC on it. Again, click on the link, find out the latest information because this tax rate, they may change from time to time. So it was 5% when I was cross, when I've helped uh, import these vehicles into Canada, it may, have, it may have changed now, all right? So click on the link, find out what it is before you actually import the car. Now, after you pay off that import tax over there, what they, the border officers over there will do is they will give you this form one, all right? And now they'll introduce you to RIV. You know that RIV that I've been talking about earlier to click on those links to find out about your vehicle? Okay, that RIV now comes into play. RIV stands for Registrar of Imported Vehicles. So they keep track of all the cars that have been imported to Canada and they maintain a registrar of that, as their name suggests. Before you can import your car completely, you have to pay them a fee. Now, the paperwork that I got from the border offices, most likely the one you'll get, is going to state that the total fee is 333 Canadian dollars, but uh, I'll show you my receipt. It's 367 dollars. Okay, the price has gone up. There's nothing you can do about it. There's no way to get around it. You have to pay that money. So, the border office is going to give you the information, and you have up to 45 days from the day you've imported this car, from the day you've processed the import at the Canadian border, you have 45 days to pay the RIV fee. Okay, so you can go home, you can pay it online. 
And what happens is once you pay it online, only then will they release the vehicle inspection form. And so they will email you this vehicle inspection form or for whatever reason that email you don't find it, it goes in junk email, you delete it, whatever happens. You can click on this link over here and you can go there, you can file in, put in your file number, vehicle details, personal information and you can free download that vehicle inspection form. So now if you get the vehicle inspection form, but you can't just get it inspected anywhere. There's only a certain number of places in every city who are authorized to do this vehicle inspection, the import or the RIV inspection. Most of the Canadian tires, they do it. So you call up that Canadian tire or that place in your city which is authorized to do it, and you schedule an RIV inspection. It doesn't cost you anything to get the inspection because the, it's included in the three sixty-seven dollars you pay for and it takes about half an hour, so you'll be able to squeeze it in and basically get an appointment. You don't have to wait like five days for it. You'll be able to get an appointment pretty quickly. And this is where that daytime running light thing that I was talking about in step three, the vehicle modifications comes into play. So Canadian Tire does a lot of this, this RIV inspections. And that is where they, uh, they find out that a lot of cars, they don't have daytime running lights. So they have the tech over there they have the technician over there who knows how to do it. They have the lighting module to rewire your car. They have all that stuff ready, and it's going to cost you around $250 to rewire your car for daytime running lights. So if you don't have daytime running lights, don't worry about calling around everywhere. Just go to Canadian Tire, tell them to fix this daytime running light thing for you, and then do the, the RIV inspection. Okay? So that takes care of it. Now, once you get the RIV inspection done, this is what a completed form looks like. So once the inspection is done, they will fax it. They're supposed to fax it to RIV, stating that the inspection's been done and the vehicle has passed it, all right? Two things can happen now. Either they will give you a physical hard copy showing that they have actually faxed it, or they'll just tell you we have faxed it and due to COVID, we do not uh, give out any more hard copies. That's, that's the change in process. If that's what happens, what you could do, is just take a picture of that, that because complete inspection form for your record. So if you have any trouble registering the car, you at least have some proof that states this vehicle has completed its RIV inspection. Okay, so at this point, uh, they'll fax it and RIV is gonna send you a sticker in the mail. It comes within a week, two weeks, whenever it comes. Take that sticker, open up your driver's side door and right where you have that manufacturer date sticker, all those tire pressure stickers, just stick that RIV sticker over there it's, it's just a sticker that states this car has been successfully imported to Canada and it meets all the Canadian uh, standards. All right, just stick it over there and be done with it. But you don't have to wait for this sticker to arrive in the mail though. As soon as the RIV inspection is done, now this is where it's a little bit different. So I've only done this in Ontario because I live in Ontario, so I have experience with it. If you're registering your car in any other province or any other territory, you need to figure it out how to do it. I can't really comment on that. But if it's Ontario, before you can register the car in Ontario, you need to have safety certification done, all right? And that costs somewhere between $100 to $150. I'm going to show you a screenshot of what the safety certification involves. So if you're watching this, you, this video while you're still in the U.S. and you don't know about mechanics in Canada or anything, just get, and you, if you have a good mechanic in the U.S., take your car to this mechanic there and make sure they check out for all these things and make sure nothing's wrong with your car. If it is, you and if you trust your mechanic in the US, might as well get it fixed over there. Because what's gonna happen otherwise, again, same thing like those daytime running lights with Canadian Tire. Once you take your car in for safety certification over here, the mechanic's gonna be like, hey, I can't certify it because there's this, 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 this wrong or wrong with your car and you have, you have to fix it. Only after you fix it will I certify it. So, if you don't know the mechanic, if it's a new country, new place, you don't really know your way around here, and so you can just get this taken care of and make sure your car is in a good condition before you even bring it to Canada. So it's gonna cost you around 100 to $150 just to get that safety check and to get this certificate. All right, this is what the certificate looks like. And there's gonna be two copies to it. One, you keep it for your records. One, you give it to Service Ontario when you register your car. So you get this safety certification done. And now you need to call up insurance and get insurance code, shop around, and get an insurance active policy. So at this point, you can go to Service Ontario and register your car. What are you going to need? First off, your U.S. title, the stamp title. You're going to need that. You're going to need the Form 1, which you got at the Canadian border, like uh, the one I just showed you over there, that one. You're going to need the 
the safety certification in Ontario. You're going to need the, the insurance policy slip in Ontario. And that is pretty much it. Now you're finally ready to register your car in Ontario. Uh, they're going to charge you $20. They're going to take your U.S. title away, and they're going to give you an Ontario registration. It's going to cost you $20 for that, for that new title. It's going to cost you $40 for the plates to get new Ontario plates. And it's going to cost you somewhere between $10 to $120, depending on which month you were born in and which month it is when you're trying to get the car registered. For instance, say if say right now it's December and you are born in, say, April, so that's four months, that's going to cost you like $40 for the vehicle tags. Or say if you're born in, say, October, then that's like $100 for the tags and so on and so forth. At this point, you are done registering your car in Ontario. You can go outside, take your U.S. plates off, put your Ontario plates on, and you can call up your U.S. insurance company and tell them that, like, I do not need insurance anymore, so please go ahead and cancel it. Again, this is the thing about insurance, all right? You're trying to bring a vehicle around. You're trying to bring a vehicle from U.S. to Canada. At no point do you want to have the car not have any insurance coverage. If, it's, if you have double insurance for a couple days, it's okay, all right? But don't cancel your U.S. insurance till you do not have Ontario plates on your car. Or at least, point is, you don't want to have any insurance gap because you never know. If you have a bad day that day, that's the day when you have that gap when something happened to your car. And that can cause a whole lot of problems when you're trying to just deal with this whole multi-step process of trying to import the car over here, right? So make sure you don't have any insurance gap at all. One of the steps to do to take care of before we close out this video is this original registration that you got. You do not want to keep this original one in the vehicle, all right? It's like your title. So what you should do is take a photocopy of this and keep the photocopy in the vehicle and keep the original with you in home at a safe location, just as you would with your U.S. title. The reason is because if the original one is in your car and someone steals your car, they can just sign it over there and sell that car to whoever they want to sell it to. Same thing. You wouldn't keep your title in your car. Same idea. So do that. And now, while this seems like a lot of hassle and a lot of steps, which it is, and you just need to consider if this is the right step for you or not. Because if, if you have to pay off a lot of money uh, to pay off the bank loan over there, and uh, your car is not really worth that kind of money and you have to get modifications done, then maybe it's not worth it to import the car from US to Canada. Or if you, if you already have a nice car over there, or, or maybe you just, it's just an old car, you just trust you know exactly what you fixed in the car, you don't want to deal with the hassle of selling the car, coming over here, buying the car, all that stuff, especially if you're trying to just move to Canada in the middle of all that, then maybe it's worth it for you. If you don't want to deal with the hassle of selling and buying new cars, that's fine then just go through this process and actually import the car to Canada, all right? And I'm based uh, in, in Ontario, so I know a few good mechanics in, in the Ottawa area and in Toronto. So if you're in the area and if you need to make a recommendation for a good place to get safety done, uh, feel free to reach out to me in the comments section below or you can reach out to me on my Instagram, at Vera Automotive, Twitter, at Vera Auto, or my Facebook page, Vera Automotive. And thank you very much for staying with me all throughout this video. And thanks again for your time, and have a nice day. Thank you.